This morning, I want to focus on what I believe is a foundational gospel truth that has been lost in the Western church, especially in the last generation or so. And that is the truth of the holiness of God. The holiness of God, I believe, is, is primary to the gospel. Without it, without understanding it, it, is, it, the gospel doesn't really make sense. And so it's one of those foundational truths. And I am convinced that when we talk about holiness, see, here's the thing. We often talk about, well, I don't know how often. <laughs> we don't talk about this very often either. But I think it's more often I hear people talk about sin than I hear people talk about holiness. And sometimes if you've had the experiences that I've had, it's difficult, especially in the United States, to convince someone that they're really a sinner. Because, well, that's your standard, and it's not my standard, and I'm living the way I want to live, and, and just, and, or, or I'm better than, than that guy over there. And it's difficult to really say, listen, no, you're a sinner. And I think that one of the reasons why it's so difficult to convince the world around us that they are sinners is because of a weak view of the holiness of God. Because really we cannot understand how, we cannot understand sin without understanding the holiness of God. And so we can, in our gospel presentation, we can show people the dangers of sin. We can show them how sin leaves us worse off later than, than when we started. We can show them how sin may even lead to certain health problems, to certain relational problems. Sin may lead to getting them in debt or it may lead to legal problems. They may end up in prison because of sin. And we can show them all these bad aspects of sin. But if we don't show them the holiness of God in contrast to their sin, it's, it's really not that much of an impact. And so we need to return to a gospel that clearly and passionately communicates to the world around us that our God is, is holy beyond our imagination and His, His holiness shines brighter than 10,000 suns and as it shines upon us, it exposes our sins and it penetrates the deepest and darkest secrets of our sinful hearts. And as we draw near to God, we more clearly see the problem in our own heart. We need to understand the holiness of God if we're going to really understand the gospel and the, the dire nature of our own sin. Unfortunately, we live in a world today that where, where nothing is really holy anymore. Have you noticed that? And, and, and Pastor Dennis was talking about this. I mean, even gender's not holy anymore. Ah, oh, it doesn't matter. You know, you can be gender fluid, Right? And, and we have gender fluid students. I mean, do, do, we have, do we have students that come and say, I decide I'm going to be a teacher today. What would the school say then? You're not a teacher. You're a student. You can't be fluid like that, but you can be. So we've lost the idea that there is a sacredness. There is something that can't be changed here. There is something that is set apart. And when you, Or talk about marriage today, right? Marriage is, is a sacred, holy thing before God, and yet it has been taken and thrown. You know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're two men or two women or a man and a woman. It doesn't matter. You can stay together as long as you want or leave. There, there's, we've lost this idea that there are certain things that are set in place by God, and they shouldn't be moved, and they are holy, and they are to be honored in our eyes and in our lifestyle. And so it's very difficult to communicate the gospel in a world like that. And I think the other problem that we, when we think about holiness is that in general, there is a wrong understanding of what holiness is in our world. And, and so I think when you use the word even holy, I mean, what pops into a lot of people's mind is some older woman scowling, looking down at you, pointing the finger and saying, you shouldn't do that. And we kind of think of holiness as sort of like not fun, wearing uncomfortable and tight clothes and, and, and being stuffy and, and generally not fashionable and sitting for long periods of time and listening to boring theological lectures and just, just really being boring. But holiness is not boring. 
It is anything but boring and those ideas of holiness are wrong. So this morning I want to look with you at the idea and understanding of holiness from God's word to help us gain a fresh and new and biblical understanding of holiness and how that understanding of holiness impacts our understanding of the gospel and of our salvation and our communication of the gospel. So I want you to look with me at Exodus chapter 3. This is the main text that I want to look at with you this morning because it is the first time that holiness is really brought out and, and specifically shown to us in the Old Testament. This is the story of Moses as he was keeping the flocks in the wilderness and just to give you a little background of the story, if you know anything of Moses' life, and I'm sure some of you do, that he, he grew up in Egypt, and he fled Egypt because he murdered someone. He was a murderer. And he fled, and he began to just be a shepherd, a, a simple, plain shepherd in the fields. And then one day God calls him and tells him, I'm going to give you this huge task this task of bringing my people out of Egypt. And what is interesting and significant is that the book of Exodus gives us a very clear illustration of God's saving power. Okay, I want you to remember that when you think of the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus is about how God saved his people and how he used a murderer to do it. So it's about God because Moses wasn't such a great guy that he was so worthy of this task. He was just a nobody out in the field who had murdered a guy a long time ago and was running from the law and had found a job way out there. I mean, I think this may be one of those areas in the United States where sometimes people get out here because they don't, they don't want to be around other people because maybe some past history in their lives or something, and they want to get out there. That was Moses. Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning. Yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now, I want to note about this passage, I think you saw there in verse 5, the concept of holy ground. Moses sees this strange phenomenon in the desert, a burning bush. And of course, he, he, he wants to go towards it. It's, it's unusual. Uh, we, we drove through Vantage in that area. It's like, there's no trees. If I saw a burning bush, I would go there too, probably. But, but I believe that what this tells us, what we see here, is we see the, the primacy of God's holiness. The first thing, after God calls Moses and just says, Moses, Moses, it's his name, that's all. He's just getting his attention. 
And as Moses comes near, the first thing that God says is, do not come near. Take your sandals off because why? This is holy ground. So this is, this is significant. This is a, a vital truth that Moses was to understand. And why was it so vital? Because as Moses was tasked to go back to Egypt and go back to Israel, he had to very clearly understand and trust in a holy and unique and powerful God who would be more powerful than Pharaoh, the most powerful God that everyone else knew of that day. And so God was, was doing something specifically here with Moses. And you have to remember that Moses came from Egypt, a land full of idols, where Pharaoh was, was the main god, right? He came from Egypt, and he came from 400 years of slavery in Egypt, and he came from a people who did not have God's word. And if you th just think about that for a second, okay, you're going to someone that has never heard, read the Bible before that knows nothing about God, that just complete, they might know other things about other gods or idols or have, you know, they're going to have some wrong ideas about God, right? But they have never picked up the Bible. They don't know who God is. They don't know who Jesus is. They don't know what the gospel is. What is the first thing you're going to communicate to them? That's the situation we have here. And the first thing God says is, it's holy ground. And it wasn't about the ground. It was about the presence of God. And so th this was a, a very important truth for Moses to understand because it would be vital to his task as he went out to lead the people out of Egypt. And I think that the concept and understanding of holiness must come first because it instructs us about God's nature. It helps us to comprehend who He is in His essence, and there probably is no other word in Scripture that better in just one word gives us a, a, an understanding and a description of who God is than He's holy. And that's why we see in Isaiah chapter 6 and Revelation chapter 4, we see that in heaven, what do these angelic beings do all the time? They say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Because that, that is the, the main truth that we need to understand about God. And when we correctly understand that truth, it informs us about who we are before that holy God. It's a basic truth of the gospel. So, a couple of, I want to look first just the nature of, of God's holiness and, and then what I would call the character of His holiness as well. The word um, holy in Hebrew is kadosh. It's, it's used about 450 times. It's quite common in the Old Testament. In fact, you could really look at probably the, the book of Leviticus. The main verse in Leviticus is, Be holy because your God is holy. The main point of all the laws and everything is God is holy and you can't just come to Him any old way you want to. And, and so all of those laws were, were enacted in, in a large part to just help people understand the holiness of God. But, but the, the Hebrew word here for holy, that it has uh, the root of, of the understanding of the idea is something that is separate. Something that is separate, and I would use two other words to describe that. Separate, unique, exclusive. And so even as we look at this story right here, we see that there's Moses out in the wilderness. I mean, it's kind of boring out in the wilderness. It's, like, it's a lot of the same, right? But a burning bush, that is unique. That is different. That is exclusive. That is not something you see every day. You, you don't see that. I mean, we see burning forests. We have smoke all over the place, right? When something burns, everything burns. But I think that even God, in choosing this method of communication to Moses, he was saying, listen, this is something special. This is something unique. This is something separate. This is something holy. 
I am holy. And so when we think about the holiness of God, we understand that God is different from us. There is part of our created being that he says we are creating God's image, right? So there's a part of us that is similar. We can have fellowship with God and, uh, and, and things like that. But, but God in his existence is different from us. Why? Because he's eternal. He has no beginning. You have a beginning. I have a beginning. God has no beginning. He's the only one. He is exclusively the only one who has no beginning. He has always existed. And so he is different. He is unique. He is exclusive. There, you, there is no two eternal beings in this world. There is only one, and it is God. God is different than us. God is different than other gods. That would be a hugely important truth to communicate to Moses and to communicate to the Israelites. Listen, this is a unique God. He's not like the gods of Egypt. It's interesting if you study some of the gods, you know, they had all of these gods and everyone was just kind of there for something you might want in your life. And so if you wanted to get, have more kids, you would go to that God. If you wanted your crops to grow better, you would go to that God. Whatever you wanted, you had a God that you could go to. Not unlike our world today, right? But the problem was those gods, they required never-ending sacrifice. And eventually they just left people flat on their face because they weren't really able to deliver in the end, were they? And so God here said, I'm holy. I'm different. I'm not like those gods in Egypt. And it would be very vital for Moses to understand that God is an exclusive God, especially living in the polyethic culture in which Israel lived at that time. And by the way, let's not forget that we live in a very polytheistic culture today. And so we must be very clear and careful that when we talk to people about God, that we tell them that this is not a God like all other gods. This is not a God that is made up. This is a God that is exclusive and that when you come to Him, He says, get rid of all other gods because He alone is God. And of course, later on in the story, we know that God would do great miracles with the plagues in Egypt. And each plague was specifically designed to show that that God is not really a God, but Yahweh is, a God, is God. Uniquely, exclusively God. And by the way, I believe that God did the plagues in Egypt not simply to show the Egyptians that, oh, our belief in our gods are wrong, but more importantly, He did it so the Israelites would see, ah, Yahweh, He is the one and holy God. But this uniqueness of God as in His holiness comes out more specifically in the Ten Commandments. Look with me for a minute at the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20 starting in verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am Jehovah your God, who has brought you out from the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. Why did He say that? He wanted them to remember. This is that God who destroyed all the Egyptian gods. This is an exclusive, unique, different, holy God. You shall not have any other gods before me. You shall not make a graven image for yourself or any likeness in the heavens above or the earth below or in the waters under the earth, nor shall you bow to them and you shall not serve them. For I am Jehovah your God, a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of fathers on sons on the third and the fourth generation to those who hate me. So in the first two commandments here, God was setting forth his holiness. What we see here is exclusivity. And that's not a message that our world really likes today, isn't it? We like tolerance. I'll believe this. You believe that. Don't tell me I'm wrong. In fact, support me in my wrong belief. And what we see is that God was, was so clear about the fact that He is exclusively God in a unique way, in a holy way to His people that He wrote it on stab tablets of stone and put it before them. God is 
holy because He is exclusive. But there's another aspect of holiness, and it is the idea of purity. And we see this throughout the law in the Old Testament, that constantly they were going back to these rituals of purity. Some of them were, were, were related to health, but some of them were just, just so that the Israelites could understand the importance of purity before God, because holiness carries with it this idea of, of purity. And when we come to God, we understand that God is the cleanest of all clean things. He is the purest of all pure things. And He is clean and pure, not because He tries to be clean and pure, but because that is who He is in His existence. And He can't be anything else. In fact, I would say that God is clean and pure because he, He's the source of those things. And so anything else that is really clean or really pure must some way, somehow have come into contact with that God, with our God. Because He's not just clean and pure. He is the source of purity. And that's why God asked Moses to remove his shoes. That's a custom in many countries. It's a custom in Ukraine. You go in, you remove your shoes immediately right at the front door. There's usually a place for shoes. I know the United States is a little bit different on that, but, but we're so used to it that oftentimes even if we go in someone else's house where they don't remove shoes, we still remove our shoes just because I feel weird walking around in my shoes in the house. But think about Moses. Moses had been who knows how long, days, months? walking around with a bunch of dirty sheep pooping all over the place and i mean his sandals were not clean and so but of course as i said it, it really wasn't about the ground it was about the presence of god and it was about teaching moses this idea of purity in all senses of the word God is pure, and of course, the greatest purity that we find in God is moral purity. And so, Moses had to understand that. And Moses had to understand that he was a murderer, right? So where was his purity? He didn't have a purity all on his own. Moses had to understand, like Isaiah had to understand in, in Isaiah chapter 6, that his purity could only be found in God himself. And it was only through faith in the pure God, that He could be pure. And so this idea of purity was, was so, so important. And in fact, I think that God did this and, and he, wanted him, he wanted Moses to see, listen, I'm sending you to bring these people out of Egypt and it's not going to be by your power. Because we know just a couple verses later, verse 11, Moses says, well, who am I, right? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and I should bring the people out of Israel? Moses understood that he wasn't worthy. He understood that he didn't meet the standard. He understood that, that he didn't have the purity and the, he didn't have the power. He didn't have the strength. He didn't have the ability to do this. But it was about God. It was about God. So God is, is, is pure in His holiness. And the, the last aspect of the nature of God's holiness is, is, is that God's holiness is something to be honored or revered. And we see this again throughout the Old Testament. It is connected with the understanding of worship. In fact, as God sent Moses out, you know the specific task that God gave Moses? It wasn't just like, hey, free my people because, you know, that's really bad there in Egypt and they probably shouldn't be there. No, it was let them go so that they can do what? Who knows? Worship, right? That's, that's the, the aspect of holiness. If we understand God as a holy God who is exclusive and who is morally pure and in every sense pure, then He is worthy of our worship. And so the idea of, of something honored, something special, something set apart for a special purpose, this was all throughout the Old Testament, and you had the articles in the temple that they were just set apart for worship. And God, I believe, wanted Moses to understand this because he was going to create not just a nation, but a worshiping nation. He was bringing them out so that they 
could worship Him. And by the way, I think it's important for us to remember when we, when we share the gospel, that the gospel is about far more than just simply saving people from the fires of hell. Yes, it is about that, but it is about bringing them to a God who is worthy of worship and falling down on your knees before Him saying, you are worthy and I will worship you and I will give my life to you because I understand who you are and what you have done for me. And we see the illustration of that in Exodus as God brings His people out and brings them to worship Him. And I think that too many churches and too many pastors in our world today have turned faith into just sort of stepping stones to a better life. And they see the gospel call as just kind of a call to living a better life and and, and having a a more successful marriage and maybe a better job and and, and things will be nice in your life if you start to come to church and and, and if you put your faith in Christ. Now, while there are a lot of benefits, certainly, to the gospel, we must understand that the gospel focuses our attention like a laser upon God's holiness and calls us to worship Him. Salvation is a call to worship a holy God. So we see that holiness is exclusive, it is pure, it is something that is honored. But now there are two characteristics here of holiness that I also want to look at. And one is simply this, holiness is good. I talked to at the beginning I said, you know, there's this wrong idea about holiness. It's kind of the stuffiness, the, it's boring, the finger pointing and all that kind of stuff. But you know what? Holiness is good. It is good for you. It is pleasant when you really understand what it what it is. And, and that would be important for Moses to understand as well. This, this is the best thing for you, Moses, the holiness of God. This is the best thing for the people of Israel as they come out and they learn to live in accordance with biblical principles and to worship God and to trust Him and have faith in Him. That is good for us. That is a wonderful thing for us. But holiness is also a very immovable and tough standard. And so while it is good, some people look and say, well, holiness, you know, God, He has too many requirements. He's too picky. I mean, you know, my God, He's not picky. He, he'll accept anyone, and it doesn't matter how you come to Him. I had a neighbor, and he was, he was Buddhist, and we had dinner together, and he told me, he said, well, you know, I think like God, He's up on the top of the mountain, and, and, and everybody has their own little path up the mountain, and, and we're all just going to get there eventually, somehow or another, right? And I said, well, no, actually, I, I've... I've hiked quite a bit, and they usually say, stay on the trail, because it's dangerous. So I said, I think it's sort of like God's on the top of the mountain, and some people are going up, and some people are going down. But some people say, well, that's, that's not a good God that would reject some people just because, you know, they weren't perfect. That, that he wouldn't let them into heaven. And so they say, I, I believe in a God that that just opens his arms and he's just a God of love, which is true, he is love. And he just, regardless of their faith, regardless of their life, regardless of anything, he just lets everybody come in. I say, well, you know, it's interesting that I think that we've imagined some sort of rule, some sort of aspects of of, of God's attitude towards us that is not in the Bible. And, And we've put upon him certain Standards that we'd like Him to have that we're not willing to put on ourselves, and I'll explain to you why. Imagine the next time you get on a plane. I'm a missionary. We fly a lot, right? So let's get on a plane. There's an amount of trust that you have to have on an airplane. Why? You kind of want the guy who's behind the stick to know what he's doing. So you get on an airplane, and the, the flight attendant comes on, and she says, well, uh, dear, friend, dear passengers, welcome to Anything Goes Airlines, and we're glad to have you here. And uh, we're getting ready to take off here very shortly, but uh, our pilot, he, he, he suddenly got sick this morning. Sorry, he couldn't make it. So uh, we're just going to put all your names in a hat, and we're going to pull out a name, and whoever we pull out, they get the privilege of flying the plane today. You'd walk off the plane, would you not? 
said, wait a minute, no, I'm not fine with anyone, even if it was me, because I can't do that. And I'm pretty sure, I mean, there may be some pilots here, but I would not fly on that plane. Well, that's my own standard. And, and here are people saying, I want God to accept anyone of any faith, of any religion, for any reason. And yet, simple, simple truth is they would not do the same themselves. Or, or let's put it in another way. Let's say you go to a restaurant. You order a nice bowl of soup. We like borscht. It's, it's red. It's kind of like, you know, the, the soup of, uh, that Esau ate. And, uh, you know, wonderful stuff. We put a little uh, sour cream in it. And, but you go to a restaurant. You, let's say you, you went to a Ukrainian restaurant. You ordered borscht, right? And they bring it to you, and there's a dead mouse floating in your soup. <laughs> you say, I'm not going to accept this. I have standards. I might get sick. That's nasty. That's not clean. That's not pure. I expect things to be clean back there in that kitchen. Honestly, sometimes I don't want to look in the kitchen when I go to different restaurants, but I expect things to be clean. I have standards. And I would suspect that you would not only send that bowl back, but you would probably leave the restaurant and never go there again. Why? Because you have standards of purity and, 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 and doing things right and cleanliness. And so how can it be that then people say, well, they have those standards, but if I turn to God, I want him to be sort of this spineless jellyfish that is just sort of, you know, all things to all people everywhere at all times. I'm sorry, I don't want a God like that. I don't want a God that's going to serve me soup with a dead mouse in it. I want a God that's going to serve me something healthy and holy and righteous and good for me. And so this whole idea that God will just accept everyone at any time, it's, it's not good. Holiness is good. And it is good for you. So we need to see God's holiness in connection with His goodness. And I think it's enough to look at creation. God put a huge amount of order and laws into the creation. We were just with Pastor Dennis down at Cannon Beach. And you look at it. You think, wow, God, this is really cool. You did all this. And despite the fact that we live in a fallen world, it's still really nice. Why? Because it adheres to a certain set of standards, of laws that cannot be unbroken. And that is why in Genesis, when God created, He created and said, it is good. Because it adhered to his standards of holiness and goodness and righteousness and truth. And whenever things adhere to that, that is good. Holiness is good, but holiness, at the same time of being good, it is also dangerous. And let us not forget that holiness is dangerous. This is why we preach the gospel. Because holiness is dangerous, and as with all good things and all beautiful things, within those beautiful things, there often lies some sort of danger that when we don't take the proper measures in approaching them, we could be harmed or even killed. And so we can see the danger in God's holiness, even in this story here, as it was a burning bush. It wasn't just a fluffy, fuzzy, and warm bush. It was a burning bush. And so Moses was interested because it was unusual, but he himself probably did not want to get too close to it. It was beautiful, but it was dangerous. And God's holiness is dangerous. And so, but it was important for Moses to understand that danger as well. Because he needed to understand that God's holiness was more dangerous than Pharaoh's ability to punish or to cause harm. And so, it is, well, it was God's holy holiness that later in Exodus chapter 19 came down on the mountain. And what was it? Thunder and lightning and earthquakes. And we see here that even when, when Moses saw that, what did he do? He hid his face. He, he was afraid. There was a certain danger in it. In fact, the danger of God's holiness was what kept Moses from entering the promised land. Do you remember that? This, this understanding of holiness was so important to God 
that Moses would now go out and communicate to the Israelites God's holiness, that there is this, this story, we can turn to it real quick, in Numbers chapter 20, starting in verse 10, when Moses and Aaron come to the rock and the people are complaining, and Moses kind of loses it a little bit, and, and he does not obey God completely, and he strikes this rock, and here's what it says, Numbers 20, verses, verse, starting in verse 10, Then Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank and their livestock. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe me, to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. That's how important God's holiness was. Moses had great responsibility as a leader. And part of that responsibility was to uphold God's holiness before the people. And when he acted as a rogue agent here and just sort of did what he wanted, God said, no, you did not communicate my holiness to them. And so I cannot allow you to go into the land. Low views of holiness will always destroy our spiritual life. And they will not only destroy our spiritual life, but they will destroy our ability to communicate the gospel. They will actually remove our motivation to communicate the gospel. We have to understand and keep God's holiness high. We can see the danger of holiness simply in created things. Lightning is a beautiful thing from a distance, right? But you don't want to get too close. Or think of a, a river we came up by Soap Lake, and I'm looking at this river. It's like, it's beautiful. It's amazing. It carved this deep gouge through stone. It's powerful, and it's beautiful, and it's great to look at, and it's useful. I mean, large ships can go up rivers, but you know what? If you fall in that river without a life jacket or something, it can take your life. And so, of course, God's Holiness is also dangerous. I love how it's put in C.S. Lewis Narnia's series where they talk about Aslan and they say, after all, he's not a tame lion. Think about that. He's a good lion, but he's not a tame lion. So you better make sure that your approach to him is in line with his word. Now, finally, I want to look just kind of make a little transition over to the New Testament. We talked a lot from the Old Testament, the understanding of holiness, but how does that really relate to the gospel? Let, let me just say this first. The gospel without God's holiness may have all the trappings of religion and look very Christian-esque and sound very good and it may call people to do very good and noble things and live decent lives, but without a clear an unhindered vision of God's holiness and the terribleness of that holiness and the goodness of that holiness, the gospel is spineless. It is like a wild animal with no teeth. It just can't do what it was intended to do. There is no light. There is no ability to see our sin and understand our decrepit state before God without holiness. There's no motivation for repentance. There's no understanding of the need for forgiveness and no comprehension of why we need a new birth. And so when our gospel message fails to communicate God's holiness, it, it doesn't just weaken the message. It destroys it. It, it takes the foundation out from underneath it and it removes the very need for salvation and the goal of salvation. So when we look at the gospel, we really see that the gospel is about holiness. And one of the verses that, well, let's take a look in the gospels, Matthew chapter 23, verse 27. We find that, mo that Jesus often had to come up with this idea of a false understanding of holiness. You see, the Pharisees, they tended to have that, what I, that, that stuffy, boring, point your finger at somebody else, scowl at them and say, you shouldn't do that. That was their understanding of holiness. And their understanding of holiness was, I'm holy, you're not so much holy. And it was arrogant. 
And so Matthew chapter 23, verse 27, how does Jesus describe the Pharisees? Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and uncleanliness. This is the opposite of holiness. And it doesn't take you very long to read in the Old Testament and read through the laws and understand the, 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 the problem of even touching a dead body would, would, would make you unholy for several days. No, he is, he is painting a picture of them that they would have been shocked to hear because in their understanding and in that culture's understanding, the Pharisees were the holy people. And God, or Jesus says, wait a minute, you are the opposite. Because holiness must start from the inside. And holiness must come from God. And unless it comes from God and it starts from the inside, you are not holy. And so Jesus pointed them to, first of all, pointed out that the Pharisees weren't holy. And then it's interesting, uh, for instance, uh, another verse here, Matthew 19, verse 17 when this young man came to Jesus and he put the question, or, or he says, good teacher, right? We talked about holiness is goodness, it's righteousness, it's, it's good, right? He says, good teacher, and Jesus responds in Matthew chapter 19, verse 17, it says, and he said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. What was his problem? He thought he was holy, this young man. He thought he had kept the commandments. And Jesus is pointing him back, saying, listen, there's only one who is really good, who is really holy, and it is God. He's exclusive. He's unique. Jesus is really our example of holiness, and we see that much of the preaching of the New Testament points us to a Messiah who uniquely, exclusively lived a completely pure and holy life. That is why he could be the Messiah. That is why he could die on the cross for our sins. And that is why he conquered death. And so, last verse I want to share here, Hebrews 7, 26. It says, For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. The author of Hebrews uses such terminology to help us understand the purity and holiness and exclusivity of Jesus as the unique person who was holy in his life here on earth. Innocent, unstained, separate from sinners, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. And so the gospel points us to holiness. It is a unique message in that sense. It is a message that points us to a holy God and a holy Messiah and helps us to see the contrast of our own lives in regards to that holiness and then says, here is the solution. And His name is Jesus Christ. The gospel is a holy message. It is a pure message. It is a message that brings us to our knees in worship. And if we preach the gospel correctly, then people will understand that they do not meet God's holy standard. They may not believe, but they will understand when we truthfully and accurately preach the holiness of God in our gospel. Let's pray.